I want to uh, share a brief cautionary tale. This isn't just about Gisborne, it's something you communities, all of you, should know about and should, uh, should be a, pay attention to. Not so much about petroleum, but it's about uh, corporations and government. I call this uh, cautionary tale, Petroleum, Politics, and People Power. <clears throat> Since the um, English exam yesterday was, uh, was all about how well you do in English, I thought I'd throw in a little alliteration. Uh, first, I need to set the scene, however. Earlier this year, I published a paper which is both a review and a critique of community-led development. You can see it. Obtain that paper on a website if you haven't already. I see the hits have been going up and down uh, prior to this gathering. I've also snuck in, unbeknownst to the organizers, a few PowerPoint handouts which have the uh, uh, website listed on it. So if you're fast, you can come up and grab, grab a copy. But we're not supposed to use PowerPoint today. So uh, I found in my paper, in my research, that there were at least four criteria or features that distinguished community-led development from everything else. And the beginning of the paper basically talked about Alice in, in Wonderland, and I think it was the Cheshire Cat? I'm not sure. Anyway, it said the word is what I say it means. And I decided that community-led development fit in that category, and I'd see how many people said community development is what I said it mean, and look at what they were actually doing. And what I found out was, um, particularly in New Zealand, there's quite a little bit of community-led development going on that met most of the criteria. A lot of it that met almost none of the criteria. But four that I noticed were uh, a place-based perspective. Um, uh, Denise has already referred to that. That is not about issues, not about the community sector, not about particular people, but it's about a, a locality as a community. Secondly, it adopts a holistic approach. That is, it's not a community and voluntary sector activity. It looks across the whole community, engages the private sector, engages local government, engages the environment. It's the whole, the whole picture. Although it may focus on particular issues like uh, family violence, for example. Thirdly, promoting authentic grassroots leadership is something that emerges out of community development and it actually relies on it uh, as being a, a key to successful community-led development. And the one I want to talk about this morning, the fourth one, it addresses broader structural processes that impact on communities. So let me say a bit more about these structural processes. I know Monica and I and others around here, I suspect, go on all day about how these things impact on communities. But let me talk a little bit briefly about them and then get quickly to the Gisborne uh, study. What do we know about structural processes? Well, I'll make these points. This is just sort of boiled over the top. First, uh, things that impact on communities, whether particularly economic or political processes, also often appear to be just the normal everyday operations of political or, or corporate institutions. They make sense, they're common sense, and they're basically the taken for granted world that we operate like development means growth, for example. That's a taken for granted assumption. Uh, there are the requirements of these institutions and, uh, and commercial organizations like new legislation. We need new legislation. We need to change existing legislation. Why? We haven't changed it for a while. Why? Because we have an agenda coming up that we actually need to change, and I'll talk about that in a minute. We need to roll out more CTV surveillance. Why? Because it's good for the community, makes us all feel safe. We need to encourage bank profits. They're up this year, by the way. We need to encourage financial deregulation. It creates well-being and wealth in the community, doesn't it? Until it all collapses. We need to incorporate, uh, a large, we need to allow corporate tax breaks and incentives. These are all common sense, everyday ways that uh, large institutions, corporations, and government operate. The other thing we know about these structural processes that impact on communities is, or that we should know, is that they're controlled by and represent powerful interests who often share similar worldviews, like the growth paradigm, 
uh, if we grow and grow and grow and get more and more wealth, it'll all trickle down so that we all share in the wealth. Except for people like Monica say there's poverty. Uh, and there's an agenda that's often behind uh, this kind of, uh, and driven by that worldview. Uh, thirdly, and also, a national and local development is frequently about unequal exercise of power. And all of you in communities will know about that, and I'm talking about the outside power that comes in. Particularly those of you who've been in partnerships. You'll find out eventually that, uh, that these are about the exercise of power. Who, who sets the agenda? These days, communities rarely set the agenda. And finally, structural processes and power relations, unfortunately, are often overlooked by community development practitioners. So uh, this gathering today is, is supposed to be provocative, and I tend to try to issue a bit of a wake-up call. To illustrate all of this, let me share the a Gisborne case study. The story so far, and I recognize that it's early days in the story, but uh, you'll be kind of interested in all of this. Uh, I, I call it Petroleum Expansion on the East Coast. It's the first chapter of the broader book that I'm writing. Not really, but it's being written. Starts with government introducing new minerals policies. Things like, well, we ought to change the way that minerals permits are granted. So what we'll do is we'll have a one-off consultation process rather than a long community involvement process. We'll give people limited time to do that. And once those permits are allowed, um, we'll just uh, give carte blanche for uh, minerals companies to go ahead and exploit the minerals. Um, we'll change the RMA. We'll make some uh, uh, pertinent amendments to the Resource Management Act to make, this is a quote from uh, our leader, to make New Zealand attractive to foreign investment, unquote. So suddenly what's happened in the East Coast in the last year in particular is the emergence of large petroleum companies, the one we have, and this is ironic for me, who used to work for the Midwest of Dakota, um, cousins of theirs, by the corporation is named after them, called the Apache Corporation. We've had, ironically, the Apaches have arrived in, on the East Coast. Uh, they've, they've teamed up with Tag Oil. Somebody's got to be writing this. Is Monty Python or somebody <laughs> writing this thing? In fact, I told our district council recently I'll, I'll mention in a minute that in the midst of all this, our district council, district regional council has yet to put in place a resource management plan. And they say it's going to take till 2021 to get it. And I said to them uh, in a presentation, does anybody hear Monty Python music, theme music played in the background here? At any rate, Apache Tag has announced that they're about to descend on the East Coast. They're one of a number. They've already taken out three permits. People in the local community are are finding out about the internet and how you go about getting on the minerals uh, uh, ministry website in the newly named, let's see if I get it right now, Ministry for Employment, Innovation, and no, Business, business in Innovation and Employment. Yeah, MBIE. They've got a website where you can get on and actually look at the boundaries of these permits. So very interesting. People are getting computer literate all of a sudden about how to do that. And we found that there are three permits that have been awarded around Gisborne. They neatly circumvent the city because I suppose people feel safe from the petroleum industry if they live inside city boundaries. We'll take a look at what's happening in America and you'll find that they're putting oil wells next to primary schools in Colorado but that's another country. And they've applied for two resource consents. We hear projected by the Petroleum Institute of New Zealand, who are very active in promoting the, well, the, the, the wonderful wonders of petroleum, that there are going to be at least 80 wells projected on the East Coast over the next five to 10 years. Did I mention that our council is going to take 12 years to get a resource management plan in place? Most of these wells will be fracked. Hands up how many people know what fracked means. No, it doesn't mean that. It means liquids go in the ground and it splits the cracks in the ground and then you suck out all the oil. Or in the States they put sand in, but it, it's the same principle. The average fracked well, we understand, if you're good enough to get on the internet and find out the real facts, not what the petroleum industry tells you, is the average, the average well requires anywhere between five 
and 25 million liters of water in order to frack one, one well. That's setting aside things like, what do you do with the waste that comes out of the ground? Well, Todd Energy figured out how to do that on Taranaki recently. Shh, don't tell about this example. They dug a big pit, right? They put all the waste in. That's what they were supposed to do under the Taranaki Resource Management Plan. That was 10 years ago. Guess what they forgot, forgot to do? They forgot to line the pit which is required under the Resource Management Act. So for 10 years, this never happens according to the petroleum industry, you never get anything, any mistakes in, in fracking. For 10 years, the Todd Energy has had a big sump hole in the ground that's been leaching into the ground. And although local Maori have been saying there's something wrong with our water, the regional council has just found out after 10 years. So Gisborne, I must say, is getting a little bit worried. However, as I mentioned, Gisborne Council has no resource management plan. Some of us have been lobbying actively, and this is no doubt all of these developments and rumors flying around about facts that are happening have got people a bit concerned. We've had the emergence of a group called a bunch of rat bag radicals called uh, Frack Free Taranaki. Sounds like a bunch of, and there are people like teachers and consultants and resource management advisors and professionals, you know, all sorts of lefty people. Uh, and they've, they've been lobbying the Gisborne District Council. I must say I've been sort of behind gingering them along, saying, come on, get in there, and, and uh, ask the council to do something. They've been carrying out PR campaigns. They've distributed an anti-fracking petition. All of these things over the past year, it's been getting really, and people have really been you know, in the newspaper back and forth. Needless to say, have I left out government and big oil? Well, they haven't been silent. We've been subject to some very interesting campaigns going on and some interesting maneuvers by government to change the Resource Management Act. You probably know this, for example, they're rushing through the change to the act, which means that councils will no longer be required to take a balanced approach in setting values in assessing resource uh, implications. The proposal, which is being rushed through select committee, is that the economic value will must override all other values in assessing a resource management concern. That's going through Parliament at the moment. Along with that, some of my colleagues from the DIA here will be aware of this, the government is in parallel rushing through changes to the RMA, uh, sorry, the, the Local Government Act, which means that we'll change the purpose statement from talking about four well-beings and sustainability, the basic structures, and providing services. Well, you can see that all of these things, plus others, are going to have an interesting effect. Now, I've developed a slide which I can't show you, but which is in the handout, which on the one side lists seven typical uh, instruments or tools that economic and corporate power uh, has been uh, using in the case of Gisborne, and I'll list them very briefly. These are the instruments that that you, know, you step back and you see these are things that, are, that are, are, are being used. One is legislation. I've mentioned that, the fast tracking of changes to legislation. Two is the exercise of political power. Not just select committee, where they're rushing through some changes, but in particular ministers arriving in our province and actually calling together local authority representatives and staff and berating them for holding up the process of allowing the, the rollout of, of big oil. Thirdly, the use of networks and influence between government and corporations, and this is happening at the national and international level. Fourthly, resources, and they are vast by these corporations. Apache alone is worth something like $4 billion, and they have lots of money. And when they come in and take over, sorry, take out a permit over the area, like they did in Montana recently, with 320,000 hectares of land being permitted, within six months, they were handing out community grants to community and voluntary sector organizations. I won't call it a buyout, but that's exactly what's going on. Uh, finally, uh, thir fourthly, research and expertise. They have lots of that, public relations spin, uh, and lots of talk about collaboration and partnership. That's very big in Gisborne among, the, among businesses in particular. And finally, if all else fails, force, the police force, surveillance, uh, security surveillance, and so on. On the other side of my chart, I have a whole list of what can community do 
which e equates to the same kind of tools. In our case, legislation, well, we've got our 10-year plan and our water planning and resource planning process. The problem is that that's all in a nice circular argument being undercut by national government's moves to change the Resource Management Act and the Local Government Act. So we've got a 10-year plan, but the rumor is that in the next round of legislation, 10-year plans may be ruled out as unnecessary. We don't need them anymore. So what do we do with our 10-year plan? Our community spent a lot of time on that. We've got EWE and, count and local council as our political force. We've got networks and influence through the internet. We've got volunteers in the community that are starting to come out of the woodwork, and I could go on. Tomorrow, I've even been, I'm from Tinny Roto. Now, how many have heard of Tinny Roto? One, okay. If anybody knows Shane Cameron, the mountain warrior, he's from Tinny Roto, okay? That's our claim to fame, sorry, that's it. And the pub, and the school. In Tinny Roto, they are organizing a community meeting on Thursday. This is what happens when you start having these things go on. I better wind up. I had a great uh, series of, of learnings that I was going to list there on that handout, things that I think we're already beginning to learn. And I had a quote, which uh, uh, two quotes actually, which I was going to end up with. One was about what I call forewarned is forearmed. That is, this looks like a concerted effort by our national government to undermine the power of local government and communities actually shape their own destiny. I won't go into that one, but in final reference, I'd say, if any of you are aware of the uh, movie Network, it was actually 1976. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember this. Peter Finch, the newscaster, at one stage toward the end, was quoted uh, as saying, uh, and, and I'll pick the salient quote at the end, you see these things going on into to, and I've got the full quote in my, in my handout. You see what's happening in our community. You see the crime. You see government exercising its power. You see big corporations exercising their activities. And people basically say, yes, I know, I know, but leave me alone. Leave me in my house with my TV and my toaster and my radial steel belt tires and so on. Just leave me alone. And of course, as some of you may remember, if you've seen that film, Finch jumps up out of his chair and says, well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get up out of your chair and I want you to open the window and get mad and say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to stand for it anymore. Thank you.